Programming Languages Researcher in the Software Technology Group at the Technical University of Darmstadt. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is a mixture out of my own research, related work, and what I think is um, good practice in general. Programming language research is really about tying together the intent of developers and what you can efficiently execute on a given platform. In particular, I'm looking at very declarative programming models or programming paradigms that are well fit for um, distributed, decentralized and coordination-free settings. Today's talk is about local-first distributed applications. We'll start with a concrete example, the to-do MVC case study, a type of application I think you're all very familiar with. It reacts to user input by updating its internal state and displaying that back to the user. You can also modify the state, resulting in this time-changing behavior typical for this kind of application. And while this is a small example, I believe you can all see how realistic applications are composed out of these same principles. Today, I don't want to show you a single instance of this application, but rather multiple instances, because I own multiple devices and I want to collaborate with my colleagues. First, I establish a connection between device A and B using this three-way handshake for a WebRTC connection. Once the connection is established, both of the devices are synchronized. You can establish multiple pairwise connections forming arbitrary peer-to-peer -peer connection between the devices and changes are propagated along the established connections. Now, as an area distributed system, you have to consider what happens in the case of failure. For example, what happens if device B crashes and is restored, which I simulate here by reloading the frame. Now, first you don't see much because the state of the device B is transparently restored. However, changes are no longer synchronized. You can still work offline. And once you reconnect to devices, um, the state is synchronized again. And most importantly, once all of the devices are able to communicate, the state of all devices is consistent, a property known as eventual consistency. The to-do list is one example of a personal productivity application, a type of application I believe you're all very familiar with from your own work. However, local-first applications are ubiquitous in many areas. Consider the many domain-specific applications that handle specific business use cases, where different branch offices or people working from home also need to collaborate. And finally, consider non-graphical cases, which are very typical for cyber-physical systems, such as this smart street light, which has a couple of sensors, a processing unit, and an actuator, which may realize applications such as detecting people nearby, and then all of the street lights in the vicinity turn on their lights. There are many more examples of cyber-physical systems, such as cars, factories, and home automation. What all of these applications have in common is their usage scenario, which has a strong focus on local computation and data. That is, data is generated from local inputs and in reaction to local events and also processed and used locally. While at the same time, there's a need for ad hoc collaboration, so collaboration with others that happen to be available or collaboration with other devices that happen to be nearby. As a second part of setting the stage, we will look at the evolution of the platform these applications are executed on. Starting with this mainframe model, where you have one centralized computer which handles all of the computation and data, and multiple users make use of this computer in a time-sharing fashion. And here, collaboration is really easy because one user just leaves the data for the next user to use. Now, from this model, we have two separate evolutions. The first one are personal computers, where each user has their own device and these devices have become very powerful so they can really handle all of the things the user wants to do with the device. 
The issue with this model is that once we want to collaborate, we have the problem that we somehow need to exchange information, exchange state, and there isn't really a good common way to do so. What happens in many cases is that the application running on a device makes use of the user for this collaboration. So the user exports the state, sends that state, say, as a Word document to another user who imports the state back into the application, exchanges, and sends the Word document back. And this is a workflow I still use every other week. Now, this can be automated better in the second development we had, which is the traditional client server model that has obvious similarities to the mainframe. Now, the client server model has evolved a couple of times. First, because we got so many clients that a single server couldn't handle them anymore, which resulted in a single data center handling many, many clients. And then, because clients are geo-distributed, the data centers also became geo-distributed. This is what we nowadays call the cloud. And the cloud is really great if you want to have all of your data in the data centers, say, for the Google search index or the Amazon storefront. However, in a local first setting, all of the data and the computation and complexity is at the local devices, the cloud really is just a liability. Consider, for example, when device A is your car's navigation system and device B is your smartphone where you've planned your route. Needing the cloud to synchronize between these two devices means that both need to be connected to the internet, while really they could just communicate directly. What we really want to do is to enable collaboration between two devices independently of the concrete network topology in between them. In particular, we want to be able to make use of direct connections as much as possible. As a side note, if you have a cool service in the cloud making use of computation and data there, then you can just add the cloud as another peer in this setup. To summarize, our platform consists of these very powerful but independent devices that can do everything that a user wants to do locally, but they also have to deal with varied network connections. In particular, they should not assume that any centralized coordination is available. Given that we now understand what the usage scenario and the platform of local first applications are, the remaining issue is that developing local first applications is still considered as hard. Developing an application is easy if the use case can be directly expressed in the chosen programming paradigm and these abstractions can be efficiently executed on the chosen platform. However, in the local first case, both the use and the platform are far away from the paradigm we use to express these applications. And what we really need is a paradigm that's much closer to both the use and the platform. To find such a paradigm, we're now going to look at the technical challenges that we need to address. The first challenge is interactivity, where the to-do list application is no longer in control of what's going to happen next, but rather is driven by these external interactions. Now, interactivity expressed in a sequential programming paradigm leads to this problem called callback hell, where some interaction um, triggers, a, triggers an observer, which changes some state, triggering a new observer, but then a new action comes in and then everything becomes a mess because the sequential paradigm and the sequential control flow is really not able to express externally driven changes. And this leads to a category of bugs uh, called glitches, where a glitch is an interaction that's unwanted between different actions. For example, Here's a file open a dialog with the presentation selected, and you can take two actions, pressing the down arrow to select the notes file or pressing the enter key to open the presentation. However, after pressing enter, there's this 200 millisecond delay. And if you wait, the presentation opens. But if during this delay, you press the down arrow, then the two actions interleave and the notes file is opened, which is something you never want to happen. And if you observe, today's applications, you find glitches everywhere. In particular, the reason why you often have to restart applications or restart your computer 
is to fix these inconsistencies that have snuck into your program. And this is really bad in um, typical cyber physical systems where continuous operation is necessary and we really can't afford these consistencies that may lead to catastrophic failure. The second major challenge is partial failure, which is especially bad in a local first setting because you can no longer apply the traditional strategy of replacing failed devices with fresh devices because in the local first setting, each device is unique and important. Collaboration is the conceptual challenge of distribution. So let's look at why collaboration actually is so hard. Um, but first, let's consider the centralized case where we collaborate um, using some coordinator, starting in some empty initial state, and then device A does an action leading to this new state. Device 2 does an action B leading to this new state, and we get this nice sequential uh, progress of states over time. In a um, decentralized setting, we still have our two devices that um, do their own actions. However, we no longer have this global state, but rather these two diverge timelines of states. We still want to end up in a consistent final state and optimally the same consistent state that um, sequential actions would have brought us to. So we somehow need to merge these states in the middle. And merging really is a, a conceptual thing um, and could be all of your collaborators sending you their parts of your report draft and you combining them into one final report. And this workflow of manual merges works pretty well in a professional setting where there are experts that know what merging should be. In general, however, this is really error prone and any errors lead to inconsistencies which we, which we really don't want. So we kind of need to make sure that this merging somehow happens automatically. So let's take a step back and consider what should a solution provide, starting with some existing solutions, such as the um, classical cloud client setup, where uh, a lot of consistency is provided by infrastructure running in the cloud, such as distributed databases, eventually consistent data stores, and things like that. However, remember that, again, all of the computational data all of the complexity is at the client and the consistency in the cloud really doesn't help much for developing this client. Now, there are approaches that kind of extend this consistency border into the client with things such as client-side databases. However, they remain with this um, client cloud abstraction where there's some border inside of the client between the interface that's consistent provided by the data store and then all of the user facing parts of the application that still need to ensure consistency manually for the user. And what we really want to is a model where consistency or the border of consistency is up to the interactions between the user and the device and consistency is also ensured over these collaboration borders devices. The meaning of consistency actually depends heavily on the use case and what your goals are. So let's rephrase this to make it more concrete into how to automate reliability. Where reliability means that in all cases, no matter what uh, failures or what challenges arise, we want the application to behave as specified by the developer such that no inconsistencies are ever introduced. We do propose a solution, Rescala, our library-based extension to the Scala programming language. Specifically, Rescala provides a declarative programming model that uses reactives to handle the challenges of interactivity and conversion data types to handle the challenges of collaboration. Both of these are combined using transactions and then the message dissemination layer handles decentralized communication. Reactives are at the core of the developer facing part of Rescala's programming model. A reactive represents a time changing value is defined by some computation, usually by depending on other reactives. For example, signals and events 
are two types of reactives, where signals are always defined and events are all only defined when they activate. As I and EI here are input signals and events, which I assumed to be generated from some external interactions. You can derive new events from existing events, for example, by mapping using some function, accessing some signal value in the process. You can also convert events to signals, um, thus accumulating state over time. And you can use arbitrary Scala expressions to um, basically access signals and events in whatever manner you desire. Because of the dependencies between reactives, they form a data flow graph with nodes representing the reactives, inputs at the top, and data flow along the edges. If you remember the to-do list application, it has this one input to create to-dos, it has the button to remove all done to-dos, and for each to-do, it has this little x to remove that particular to-do. This is the code of the to-do list, specifically the part that handles the list of to-do items. And see the remove all input, which is coming from the UI, the create to do event, another input from which we um, derive this create task event, where a task ref is the in memory representation of each entry in the to do list. And these task refs have these ta uh, task data, which internally have these little remove single to do buttons, which is, then which is then represented by this remove click event. So all three of these um, input events flow into this large signal down here, which is a signal of a replicated list. So it's a list that changes over time. And it changes every time one of these three um, events occurs according to a specification um, done by some Scala function. And then this overall task list is later used in the representation of the UI, such that all of the changes you make are immediately visible. Now, going from the representation of the interactivity and the data flow graph to the question of how we handle these replicated data structures, which are part of the graph. Um, so here again, we just have the definition of the task list, which is a signal of a replicated list. And we can then actually um, do the replication of such a data structure by just asking the network runtime to replicate this signal given a registry which defines the connections to other devices and a name which defines how other devices find this specific re replicated reactive. To ensure consistency, in addition to the above, we also need an instance of type lattice of replicated list of task ref. If you're familiar with type classes, this is Scala's way to represent them. If not, consider lattice as just a normal interface that we need to implement for this replicated list type. So lattice of A, which means that A is a lattice, has a single method, merge, that takes a left A and a right A and produces a new A. In addition, we must ensure this method is associative, commutative, and idempotent. This is the only thing a developer of such a data structure ever needs to ensure to um, guarantee distributed consistency. If our merge function fulfills these three properties, then the space of all states in our system has a structure that looks like this. Merging two states A and B results in a new state AB, which is the least upper bound of the two merged states. And the really nice property about these least upper bounds is that no matter the order we merge things in, and no matter how often we merge things, we always end up in the same state. Thus, the least upper bound, or more concretely, the properties of our merge function, precisely address this issue we had with collaboration, where we have these two diverged states, which we somehow have to merge into a consistent state. If and only if the state space forms a lattice, then we can always do these merges automatically. Having covered the theoretical side, the question then is, how do we actually implement a replicated list and how do we obtain a lattice? First, we have to understand that a replicated list 
is a composed data type. Concretely, this means that our replicated list type is just a triple out of a G list, which is a replicated list where you can only add but not remove. And a dot is a globally unique timestamp. We also have a map from dots to nodes, which we use to track removals. And we have a set of dots for causality information. To acquire a lattice for our replicated list, we make use of its composed structure and the fact that lattices also compose. We define a lattice for any triple A, B, and C, given that A is a lattice, B is a lattice, and C is a lattice. By merging the left and the right triples, just merges the components individually. Relying on composition to derive new lattice instances is the major advantage for developers that associativity, commutativity, and item potency are provided automatically. And this is the only thing we need to rely on to ensure consistency. So all composed lattices are always correct. Only manual merge implementations need to be proven. The only remaining piece to complete our replicated data type are the operations to insert and remove elements from this list. However, during the implementation of these operations, we do not need to concern ourselves with any of the challenges of distribution, replication, or consistency, because it's not possible for these operations to invalidate the properties provided by our lattices. We can thus focus on the functional correctness, making sure that insertion actually inserts and removal actually removes. In summary, our state, merge, and operations combine into what's known as convergent replicated data types, or CRDTs. And while CRDTs are widely used in geo-distributed database systems, ensuring causal consistency and high availability, we believe that a language integrated approach, where the state is just an algebraic data type, merging just defines a category of states, and the operations really are just functions, enables application developers to compose and combine these smaller pieces into data structures that really represent their core application logic, as opposed to typical CRDT implementations, which are provided as black boxes, where developers somehow have to fit the application into whatever interface the CRDT provides. Now we've seen how reactives handle the challenges of interactivity and convergent data types handle the challenges of collaboration. However, if you remember our goals, we wanted to achieve consistency from one user to the other over these collaborative edges. And what we currently have is a declarative programming model for these interactions, and we have a way to achieve consistency um, on this collaborative edges, but we really need to expand this consistency to the overall application. The way we do this is by ensuring that the data flow graph itself is a lattice. First, by defining its state. We have already seen the task list, which is a signal of such a replicated data type. The task data um, is the representation of the individual to-do items, which is a signal of a last writer wins, a different replicated data type. These two data types are the values of these nodes in the data flow graph. Now, in addition to the state, we have to think about the operations. The data flow graph itself handles arbitrary incoming interactions. So the question is, what is the concrete set of possible operations we can do? And this is where transactions come in. So transactions group reactions that happen at the same time. For example, if this input up here changes, then all of the derived reactives also have to change conceptually at the same time. And we ensure this in our runtime environment using our transactional mechanism. And then each transaction becomes a single operation. It leads to the following local execution model, where we have some initial state and then a transaction A, 
which changes the screen part of the transaction, resulting in a new state A. Now note that um, this transaction changes both values of the nodes in the existing data flow graph, but it may also add new nodes to the data flow graph as Rescala supports fully dynamic graphs. Then we may have a transaction B and a transaction C, again, both doing their changes to the data flow graph. Now, as a technical note, what we consider a transaction in the model that transactions are operations is um, basically this green part here. So a transaction is a function that takes this initial state and essentially produces um, this green changed part, not the full new state. And we'll see why in a second. After defining the state of the data flow graph as the association between the nodes and their values and the operations on the data flow graph as the transactions, the question remains how to merge two states. And the answer is that we again use composability of lattices to derive a new lattice for the data flow graph, similar to the merge function of tuples, where we merged all components of the tuples individually, the merge function of a data flow graph merges the value of each reactive in the data flow graph individually with the corresponding value of the corresponding reactive in the other data flow graph, producing this new value. If a reactive was only changed in one of the two transactions we want to merge, like this last writer wins um, reactive here, which is not changed on the other side, then we just keep the value of that reactive as is, which is equivalent to merging it with an empty state. You may now be wondering, what about the reactives that are upstream from the two derived reactors? So the three inputs and this one derived reactive up here that seem to exist in both states, but not in the merged result. This is because we distinguish between replicated reactives, which do have correspondences in other states and all of the other reactives, which don't actually have corresponding reactives in the other state, even though they look structurally similar. And this makes sense because, for example, in the to-do list, we do want to replicate all of the to-do items, but we do not want to replicate the input fields where the user types the current to-do they want to add next. So even though both devices may have such an input box, these are two separate things. They never exist on the other device, so we also never need to merge the state and we don't even need to include the state in the merged result. An exception are reactives derived from replicated reactives, which should be consistent as they are derived from consistent values. Now, we cannot merge them directly because we don't have a merge function for their values. However, Derived reactives are fully specified by the computation that computes their value from the inputs. So for the merged value, we simply also recompute the merged result from the merged inputs. Now we've seen how reactives and convergent data types are combined and handle the challenges, but what we've seen so far is very much the programming language design and implementation side. What I also want to talk to you about is replication from the system side. So let's look again at one of these collaborating device diagrams where we again have our two devices starting in states B and state BC. And now if device one in state B does a transaction, remember transaction results in this um, kind of delta state only with the changed reactives, um, which we also call here A. And then we take this delta state and locally merge it to produce the full state AB. Now the advantage of this local merging is that no matter how the operations are implemented, this local merge ensures that all of our consistency guarantees remain. In addition, because we have this delta state, we can very efficiently send it to another device because the changes are assumed to be much smaller than the full state is. And the remote device, we just merge the state as usual to produce a new state. Now, we're in the situation where 
device two and device one are still not consistent, right? They're in different states because somehow device one never received this change C up here. And we can now, at any point in time really, just compute any delta, so any subset of this state, send this over, merge it, and achieve consistency. Now, while this computing state sounds somewhat hand wavy, this actually is a huge opportunity for optimization depending on your um, concrete use case. For example, if you assume you have a stable TCP connection, then you can just always send these deltas and assume that they are applied on the remote side and you have to do nothing else. When your use case requires you to um, write your state on a USB stick, put that USB stick in a bottle, drop it in the ocean and hope that your um, communication partner finds the bottle, then maybe you, instead of computing a small delta, always put the full state on the USB stick to send that over because then the chances that you actually reach a consistent state are much higher. In addition, to allow you to optimize individual components for your specific use case, the modular architecture also allows you to introduce new functionality. For example, if you're worried that your bottle is found by someone you don't trust and you want to encrypt the data on your USB stick, you can do so by introducing a new component that sits in between the convergent data types and the message dissemination layer and provides this encryption. Introducing this encrypted layer works by essentially implementing the interfaces of both a replicated data type and the message dissemination layer. So our encrypting data type has a state that essentially is a set of encrypted messages. And it has a merge function that in addition to merging also ensures that older states we no longer need are removed based on metadata without needing to know what exactly is inside of the state. This is a performance optimization. And then our operations are sending and receiving and recombining these states. We're sending encrypts and recombining decrypts the state within this data structure. Note that we did not have to take care of any of the networking logic because that's handled by existing message dissemination layers. And we also do not need to adapt any of the existing application logic. In summary, Rescanner provides library additions for a declarative programming model to the Scala language from which we can derive this transactional data flow graph, which is both really good at defining interactive applications of all types, but also has this fundamental mathematical model of how to deal with collaboration such that no matter what kind of network failures you have, your application semantics always remain the same. The remaining question is, is it fast? Short answer, yes. Longer answer, it depends. So on a 144 Hertz monitor, if you want to update 100 reactives every frame, you have seven milliseconds to do so. Only 11 microseconds are used for Rescala's transaction logic and the remaining 99.7% of the time, your application can do whatever it wants. Performance of distribution, replication and network communication is even more heavily dependent on the chosen use case. So it's really hard to give one single answer here. However, to at least give you an intuition, I show here a comparison between a Rescala implementation of the to-do list, a implementation using Twilio Sync, which is a commercial synchronization framework using a centralized server, and an implementation using Flask, which is a Python web framework. As you can see, the computation Flask is much faster than the other two solutions as it doesn't achieve any kind of consistency. However, we were actually surprised that Rescala is comparable to Twilio because Rescala has to do much more local operations to ensure consistency. But really, the important point of most applications is that as soon as any kind of centralized coordination is involved, 
network latency really dominates all other tasks. Because in Twilio's case, whenever you want to add an item to the to-do list, you have to wait until the server answers, which actually introduces a latency that's very noticeable to the user. If you'd like to see more benchmark and more concrete numbers, you can find them in the rescala repository or in our published papers. In general, the two trends I've shown you are confirmed by all the experiments we've done so far. While this is not part of rescala proper, we've shown that you can take the static data flow graph subset of rescala and compile it to sequential code that has no overhead compared to handwritten C code which allowed us to implement the programming model in a way such that it can run on an embedded device, specifically on a Wi-Fi chip. This means that the overhead that we currently have really is just an implementation detail that we use as a trade-off to get more dynamic features and better integration into the Scala ecosystem. This concludes the technical part of my talk. We want to speak a bit about the social aspects, because even though I'm not an expert in that area, I do believe that reliable local-first applications are an important piece in the data ownership puzzle. Some people call data the new oil, but then again, if you're not an oil company, what are you going to do with all the oil? A lot of companies don't even really know what most of their data is about. They just collect it for the fear that they are missing out on future wins. And I mean, storing data is like storing data just technically is expensive. You have to pay for the storage. And most of the use of data comes out of like very personal information and making private data or very user specific data secure is even more expensive because things like the GDPR are very particular about health data, for example. With data being a liability, it's mostly large providers that profit from the current state of the art because they build these centralized walled gardens and profit off of the data in a multitude of ways. This, on the one hand, stifles competition, which, on the other hand, leads to this issue that users are forced to use a bundle of mediocre applications just because those work well together and have access to their data. A language based approach really has the potential in the midterm to provide data availability on the user's devices, where many different applications can make use of the same data and share data in a way that's comfortable to the user. This does not only foster competition, but also has this potential for mutual enhancements, where if your application provides a data source, this can also be used by others. Now, this model can also be seen in the provider setting where the provider does have APIs such that others can provide these enhancements. However, this is never mutual because as soon as the enhancement becomes popular enough, it will just be assimilated into the centralized platform, again, reinforcing the current state of the art. While the social problems remain open and are likely things we have to keep fighting for in the future. Other challenges, such as partial failure, interactivity, and collaboration, really do have good solutions in declarative programming models that extend and complement existing concepts that programmers are very familiar with, while at the same time having mathematical foundations that allow to address the challenges even in the most adversarial circumstances. This concludes the talk, but if you want to learn more, um, the best place to start is the Rescala website. In particular, if you would like to dive more practically into the programming paradigm, we have a one hour, 40 minute um, video lecture that demonstrates how to write a distributed local first application starting from an empty Scala project and really going through everything step by step in a live programming fashion. You can also visit our research group and there's lots of interesting and good stuff there. Or if you want to talk to me directly, feel free to send me an email. If you're even more interested in this topic, we're organizing a workshop on programming local-first software co-located with eCoop in June. 
The workshop is very much about the topics I've presented here and will be in the form of presentations and discussions. You can submit your own proposals for talks about systems, about use cases, about things you need are important for this topic. If accepted, you will get a 30 minute talk slot, including some discussion. You can also submit in progress papers. This is mostly um, targeted as researchers, which will also involve a talk, but we will also provide feedback on the paper with things you may want to improve, with other things you may want to consider. With that said, I hope to see some of you at the workshop. And this is it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention.